Καλησπέρα σας. Good evening. Απόψε είναι διάλεξη είναι στα αγγλικά. Και αυτό το λόγο από τώρα μιλάμε αγγλικά. I will start with an announcement. In 2010, we had a conference called Mycenaeans Up to Date. It was a huge conference organized by Anne Louise Salin and Ifigenia Turnavitu. And now the proceedings are finally being published. The release date is 15th of December. And this is a big ev event for us. It's the biggest book the Swedish Institute has, has ever published, 632 bases. So we'll have a release party as well, and this will be 12th of February. And at, the, at that occasion, we sell the book as well at, at half price, which is going to be for, for the euro. So spread the word. One of the speakers in this conference was Helen Wittager, as she has been in many other conferences and symposia we have organized at the Swedish Institute. And Helen is also an old timer at the Swedish Institute. She told me today that she came here for the very first time in 1981. And this is even earlier, before I was here for the very first time. Helen studied at the universities in Bergen, Oslo, and Tromsø, all in Norway. And she defended her thesis on Mycenaean cult buildings at the Tromsø University in 1996. And this was later published in, in the Paul Ostrom series. Helen stayed in Tromsø first as a, as a senior lecturer and then as a full professor till 2012. This is a very, I think it, it must be the northernmost university in the whole yes, world. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very dark place in the winter, I suppose. Yeah. And since 2013, Helen is professor at, Goth at Gothenburg, Gothenburg University, professor in ancient culture and society. Or no, classical archaeology and ancient history yes, is called that's right, yeah. these days. Mm, okay. Yes, Helen's main research interest has, has always been DSA and Bronze Age, and especially its, its religion. And her bibliography is very huge, five pages. And I guess I mentioned one, her latest monograph, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2014. It was called the Society and Religion in Middle Bronze Age, Greece. Her other interests include Homer, Neoplatonism, Roman Greece, and early Christianity. But today's lecture will be on Mino and Crete. And this, I suppose, is where it, all, where it all, be, all began. Helen participated in excavations in Comos and Moklos yes. as a student. So please, Helen. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. I'm always very happy to come to Athens. Um, can you hear me? No. You can? OK, good. Um, let's see. OK. okay. Um, I suppose like most people who worked on my known archaeology, I've been fascinated by the double axe. And the double axe is what I'm going to be talking about this evening. Uh, and I'm afraid this is going to be a fairly wide-ranging and perhaps a bit speculative paper. So uh, I hope you can bear with that. Um, the double axe was undoubtedly an important symbol in Bronze Age Crete. Even if its precise symbolic value remains enigmatic, most people would probably agree that it was associated with the expression of power and that it had ritual connotations. My purpose here is first to discuss the meanings that have been suggested in a wider context of axe symbolism, and second, to investigate the connection between the double axe and cattle. I will start with a very brief overview of the material and a review of the various interpretations that have been put forward for the ritual symbolism of the double axe in Minoan Crete. As a symbol, the double axe is found in corpora in the form of votive replicas from the early Minoan period onwards. A small double axe with flaring edges made of solid copper and two miniature double axes of made of lead were found in tomb two at Mohlos, dating to the early Minoan II period. Five axes of the same type, which come from an informative context of Chamaisi, Vasiliki, Festos, and Ayatriada, are somewhat later in date. 
Although these are large enough to have had a practical function, they show no signs of use, and Keith Brannigan has suggested that they are also likely to have been votive. Three double axes were found outside Tolos A at Platanos, and these seem to have been votive offerings. Two of them were clearly non-utilitarian, as they were made of sheet copper, while the third is a solid cast miniature axe. The perhaps most well-known examples of votive double axes are the miniature axes made of gold foil from Ahalohori. The axes made of bronze sheet that were found in the Sikho cave come from a definite ritual context. Right. The double axe also occurs from an early date in textual and iconographical representations which seem to have a symbolic or ritual significance. It constitutes one of the signs in the Ahanish script where it occurs variously with representations of bovine heads, horns of consecration and jugs, all of which are generally accepted as having been religious symbols. Mariana Nicolaidu has also argued that they were important as cosmological symbols that were used to legitimize power from the early palatial period onwards. The connection between the double axe and writing endures to the end of the Bronze Age. It is found with a jug on a hieroglyphic seal from Festos, and it also occurs as signs in linear A and linear B. The perhaps most well-known representation of the double axe is on the Aya Triada sarcophagus, where we see large double axes in what will quite clearly seem to be a ritual context of sacrifice and funerary cult. On one of the long panels, we see a divided procession of men and women carrying various objects. The women are carrying large jars from which they are pouring some kind of liquid into a larger jar placed between two double axes. On the other long panel, we see a bovine lying on a table to which it has been tied. Several people approach in procession while a woman is standing in front of an altar, or what we presume to be an altar. Behind the altar, we see another structure with horns of consecration, presumably a shrine. Between the shrine and the altar stands a massive double axe with a long shaft. On both panels, birds perch on the middle of the double axes, which are of an elaborate double-edged type. They seem to have been placed in stands of a type similar to those that have been recovered from archaeological contexts. Also worth mentioning is a mold from the late Minoan III period that shows a woman holding a double axe in each of her upraised arms. The double axe is essentially a utilitarian chopping tool, the invention of which was probably associated with the need to fell trees in order to clear land. It can, however, be used for many other purposes, as has been demonstrated by Maria Lowe Free through her examination of wear marks on utilitarian double axes found on Crete and by experiments with replicas. Representations of double axes show them with either curving sides and or flaring ends, which are sometimes doubled to decorative effect as on the Aya Triada sarcophagus. Hans Günther Buchholz has argued that Minoan double axes can be distinguished into five types which also represent a chronological development from a basic rectangular form to, a more complex, to more complex variants. In relation to types 1 and 2, type 3, with its concave sides, represents a new and improved version in that it requires less metal and is lighter and therefore easier to use. Hans Günther Buchholz did not distinguish between functional and non-functional axes in his typology, but it would seem probable that type 5 was developed for aesthetic and symbolic reasons rather than for any practical purpose. The examples of functional double axes from the Bronze Age that have been found on Crete have more or less straight sides. And molds for casting double axes have also been found, which demonstrate that newly made axes would have been rectangular in shape that is corresponding to Buchholz type 1. Depictions of double axis from the later Greek period also sometimes show them as straight-sided. 
Maria Lofi has shown that the sides of the blade will sometimes become curved as a result of repeated use. It therefore seems that representation it therefore seems that the iconographical representations and non-utilitarian replicas of double axis from Mayan and Crete, which invariably depict the long sides as deeply concave, are of axes that are thought of as having been used for some particular purpose. And that the symbolism of the double axe was derived from the use or uses to which it was put is perhaps further indicated by images on seals, which show both men and women on the way to somewhere, carrying large double axes in a purposeful manner. A seal impression from Ayatriada shows a man and a woman carrying large double axes, and they're clearly walking somewhere. And the ceiling from Sacros shows two women walking in a single file, the second of which is carrying a double axe, while the ceiling from Knossos shows a woman holding a double axe with both hands. And the symbolic value of the double axe has been variously interpreted. It has been regarded as a general religious symbol, identifying in certain places as ritual, as the attribute of the great Minoan goddess, and because it has sometimes been found in burials as a symbol of rebirth. That the double axe was associated with the sacrifice of bulls and used to kill, or perhaps more probably to stun the animal before slaughter, as first suggested by Martin Pearson Nielsen, has been and is still perhaps the most widely held interpretation of its ritual significance. For example, in a recent book on cattle culture in ancient Greece, Jeremy McInerney suggests that the ceremonial double axis on display in my known palatial courts were intended to commemorate the sacrificial slaughter of bulls. Moreover, from the later Greek period, there is also good evidence for an association between double axis and animal sacrifice, which could suggest that there was ritual continuity between the Bronze Age and later periods. In a simile of death on the battlefield in Book 17 of the Iliad, an axe is used to strike an ox behind the horns in order to cut through its neck before it is dispatched. Similarly, in the third book of the Odyssey, where Nestor's sacrifice to Athena is described, the tendons of the animal's neck are cut with a sharp axe so that it collapses on the ground before being slaughtered. And the Greek word used for the sacrificial axe in both the Iliad and the Odyssey is pelikus, which is thought to refer specifically to a double-bitted axe. And the use of the double axe in connection with the sacrifice of cattle in the later Greek period is also attested in a black figure vase painting that shows an animal being led towards an altar. From a more general chronological and geographical perspective, the symbolic importance of the double axe on Crete could be seen in the context of a long-lived association between axes and cattle in the sacrificial tradition of the wider Mediterranean area, stretching from as early as the 6th millennium BC to the end of antiquity. The spectacular finds of rock carvings dating to the second half of the 5th millennium from the Mesak Plateau in Libya constitute an early illustration of the association between axes and the sacrifice of cattle. It has been pointed out, however, that the double axe is never depicted as actually being used to stun or kill sacrificial animals in my known iconography. Although there is a clear association between double axes and cattle, in images of sacrifice, the sacrificial implement would seem to be a knife or a sword, as first pointed out by Martin Persson Nilsson, and has since been reiterated by Nano Marinatos. Moreover, a direct iconographical association of the double axe with cattle does not appear before the end of the Middle Minoan period. This does not necessarily invalidate the sacrificial hypothesis, but it may signify that its original significance was other. The double axes that are shown in what will quite clearly seem to be a depiction of the sacrifice of a bull or a, a bovine on the Ayatriada sarcophagus would seem to be emblems denoting the ritual character of the activities taking place or markers of boundaries of ritual space 
rather than sacrificial instruments about to be used. The double axe also occurs in a, as a symbol in various contexts which seem unrelated to animal sacrifice, which may be a testament to its wide-ranging ritual meanings, which may or may not be associated with sacrificial symbolism. Various kinds of axes, both single-bitted and double-bitted, have been widely used in warfare in many places and meant in different periods of time. Images of axes used as weapons can be found from the Bronze Age to the more recent past. Moreover, axes are very versatile weapons since they can be used in close combat, held with one or two hands, depending on the size or the weight of the blade, or hurled as a missile from a distance. With regard to close combat, the double-bitted axe is particularly efficacious in that it can be very quickly swung from one side to the other to deal with enemies to the left and right. Rejecting the sacrificial hypothesis, Matthew Hasem has argued that in addition to its primary function as a tool, the double axe was used as a weapon in Minor and Crete, and that its symbolic and ritual meanings would have been related to its use in warfare. It is clear that heavy double axes, such as many of those found on Crete, could undoubtedly function as effective weapons in combat. Furthermore, depictions of other objects associated with warfare, such as a figure of eight shield or unfunctional double axes, could be taken to indicate their military function. The double axe is, however, most often associated with a female figure in my non iconography, which could, although not necessarily and perhaps not, be an argument against any strong symbolic associations with warfare. A Carnelian shield with a depiction of, of a woman brandishing a, swore, a sword could suggest that warfare was not an exclusively male activity in my known Crete. Associations between warfare and religious beliefs are very common. Religion can be a motivation or a pretext for war, or it can lie at the core of religious belief systems, as may have been the case in much of the ancient world. The idea that warfare was essentially a manifestation of the will of the gods rather than a willful human action has a long history in the Long East, in the, in the ancient Near East and Egypt, and is also evident in early Greek literature. As related by Hesiod in the Theogony, warfare lay at the heart of ancient Greek cosmology. It is through warfare that the world of the gods moves forward from one generation to the next, and Zeus achieves supremacy, a supremacy which he must always be prepared to defend through violence. The story of the siege and destruction of Troy illustrates, as do several other myths, how warfare was also believed to regulate the relationship between humans and gods. When the Trojan prince Paris flouts the laws of hospitality by running away with or abducting the wife of his host, the Greek king Menelaus, this was not just a breach of good manners, but also an offense against Zeus, and as such a violation of the bond between humans and gods. Moreover, the Trojans have form and Paris' behavior is just the latest in the long line of transgressions against divine law. As a consequence, warfare was inflicted upon them as the means through which the gods could destroy cosmic order. As has been pointed out by Barry Molloy and Matthew Hasem, the warlike aspects of my known civilization have tended to be ignored or underrated. However, there is evidence that points to the existence of meaningful links between religious beliefs and warfare. The votive material found in the Psycho cave would seem clearly to manifest an association between double axes, warfare and ritual meaning. The material includes actual weapons such as daggers and spearheads, as well as numerous replicas of sword or dagger blades and double axes, which had most probably been made specifically for ritual deposition. The replicas of weapons are either miniatures made of cast bronze or full-size blades made of thin bronze foil. The majority of the blades and double axes were found inserted into the stalagmites and stalactites of the lower chamber. A number of lamps, which would have been necessary for moving deeper into the cave, were found in the upper chamber. 
For those who made their way down into the lower chamber with their offerings, the visual effects of the reflections from the pool of water at the bottom of the lower chamber and the gleam and flash of the bronze axes, spear heads and blades that others before them had placed in the stalagmites and stalactites must have been tremendous. The material from the Sucro cave can be compared with the more or less contemporary deposit found at Akalahori, which includes swords, replicas as well as actual weapons and double axes, functional as well as replicas made of thin bronze or gold foil. Large and small double axes were found with daggers in the peak sanctuary on Mount Yuktas in north central Crete. In a Mycenaean context, a similar association between double axes and weapons can also be seen in the open air sanctuary on Mount Kinortion, where replicas of double axes made of sheet bronze are found with swords and daggers, both actual weapons and replicas, as well as spearheads. From a wider geographical context of double axe symbolism, there is some support for a definite association between warfare and the double axe from the early Bronze Age onwards. Some of the most striking examples of the symbolic significance of the double axe can be seen in representations on northern Italian stone steel life from the Copper Age. On one stela, we see a double axe in the upper part of the stone, below which are three triangular daggers carved in low relief, which suggests that the message of the imagery relates to warfare. Double axes are possibly also to be recognized on Bronze Age stelae from Iberia. However, although the association of double axes with warfare is in many ways convincing, in relation both to the specific Minoan context and to a wider geographical and temporal context, none of the images of warfare that do exist from Crete shows double axes actually being used as weapons in combat. On a very different tack from interpretations that emphasize the symbolic significance of the double axe as an instrument of death, whether in relation to animal sacrifice or warfare, Nano Marinatos has recently argued that it represents the sun and is the emblem of a solar goddess. Her interpretation is based on comparisons of Minoan depictions with Near Eastern and Egyptian imagery and on the fact that the double axe is interchangeable with the sun disk in Egyptian and Near Eastern imagery. In contrast to those who argue for a meaningful association between practical function and symbolic meaning, she does not seem to believe that there is any connection between the double axe as a religious symbol and as a functional tool or weapon. Although she does not refer to material from other parts of Europe, it is interesting that her interpretation is similar to that of Miranda Green, who argues that axes, whether double or single, were associated with solar cult, which she believes played a major role in the religious beliefs of the prehistoric inhabitants of continental and northern Europe in the Bronze and Iron Ages. It is evident that axe symbolism was widespread in continental Europe from an early date, and Anthony Harding has even argued that axes in general can be seen as one of the most important cult symbols of Bronze Age Europe, transcending boundaries of space and time. The extent to which the Minoan double axe should be seen in terms of a pan-European symbolism seems to me, however, to be an open question. In my known Crete, representations of the double axe seem, on the one hand, to occur in contexts, such as on the Ayatriada sarcophagus, that suggests that it had a very definite and circumscribed symbolic meaning, or ritual meaning, that would have been recognized by all Minoans. On the other hand, if we look at the variety of different contexts in which it appears, it will seem to incorporate a multitude of possible functions and ritual meanings, which may also have varied over time. In iconographical representations in Minoan Crete, the double axe can be associated with flowers, vegetation, birds, horns of consecration, and bovines. The latter are often referred to as bulls, but this identification is not always verifiable. They could just as well be heifers, cows, or steers. 
And the purpose of the remainder of this paper is to discuss the particular meaning of the relationship between the double axe and cattle in my known iconography. In many depictions of the combination of double axe and bovine, only the head of the animal is shown. In some, in some cases, the shaft of the axe seems almost to have been planted in the animal skull, between, animal skull between the horns, as can be seen on a seal fragment from the Northwest Treasury at Knossos, or on a large jar from Sira, and on gold foil cutouts from Grave Circle A at Mycenae. In other cases, the axe is shown floating upside down between the horns, as on a jar from Palais Castro. And on a seal, supposedly found in the area of the Argive Horion, which, like the gold foil cutouts um, from Mycenae, may indicate a mainland inter interest in the motif. Functional double axes with, on which representations of bovine heads have been incised also indicate that there was a particular meaningful association between the double axe and cattle. One example comes from the Amari Valley. Can you see? Yeah. Um, another was found in the Knossos region from an uncertain context. It may be significant that in both cases, the head of the bovine would have been the right way up only when the shaft was pointing upwards, as would be the case if it was being held or was hanging upside down from a peg or a nail. Examples of votive double axes with a hole in the shaft, such as can be seen on some of the axes made of gold sheet from Akalahori, indicate that it may have been common to hang double axes by a ring through the base of the shaft from a peg on the wall when they were not in use. This suggests that they were intended to be admired for their beauty as artifacts as much as for their practical function as tools, weapons or sacrificial implements. The close iconographical connection between cattle and the double axe might seem to support the idea that, in part at least, the symbolic meaning of the double axe was derived from its use in sacrificial ritual. It is, however, arguably significant that in most representations, in most representations that indicate a meaningful association between cattle and double axes, only the head of the animal is depicted. Although they are often referred to as bucrania, the heads are clearly those of living animals and are not defleshed skulls as seen, for example, in Roman sacrificial iconography. And this is particularly evident from the fact that the ears are shown as well as from the rendering of the nostrils and the eyes. The connection would therefore seem to be between live animals and the double axe. Consequently, if we do not find the uh, if we, um, consequently, if we do find the interpretation of the double axe as a sacrificial implement less than convincing, some other explanation must be sought for the association between double axes and cattle in Minoan Crete. And the general impression provided by the imagery is that the double axe was specifically associated with the horns of the animal. And I will here propose that the symbolic value of the double axe in connection with cattle was derived from its use in cutting the horns of living animals so that they could be fashioned into a desired style. And my arguments are based on ethnographic and comparative archaeological evidence. Horn shaping is practiced today in different parts of the world for different reasons and using different methods. In order to protect their animals from damaging each other when crowded together, breeders of non-polled cattle may modify the horns so that they come to curve downwards rather than outwards. This can be done by attaching weights to the tips of the horns as they are growing. A comparable method of altering the natural shape of the horns of cattle may have been in use in antiquity, as suggested by figurines of bovines from Roman Britain, in which the tip of the horns have knobs attached to them. The conical attachments that were part of the horns of the Vixo helmets are possibly also to be identified as representing horn shaping weights, indicating that the practice may go back to the Bronze Age on the European continent. 
The two helmets which were found in a bog in northern Denmark mimic the hem heads of bovines. They are made of beet and cast bronze and have been dated to the early part of the first millennium BC. The knobs are also on the evident on the helmet horns of a contemporary figurine wearing a helmet of this type. A particular interest in the horns of cattle is also generally evident in Scandinavian late Bronze Age rock carvings, which generally show cattle with, with exaggerated horns, indicating an interest in the horns, if not specifically in manipulating them. The direction in which the horns of cattle grow can also be altered by a method known as sloping, which entails slicing, slicing the tips off at an angle. Although the shaping of horns in modern farming is done for practical reasons, there is also a symbolic aspect to the procedure in that breeders who choose species of cattle whose horns are a liability do so because they value animals with horns for aesthetic and traditional reasons. And the horns of animals have a dual function associated with the defense and with display. In domesticated cattle, the horns do not generally serve any practical defensive purpose, and it is perhaps for this very reason that they be can become the locus for important metaphysical values and beliefs held by their human owners. The practice of shaping the horns of cattle is widespread among pastoralists in Eastern Africa, where the reasons would seem to be entirely symbolic and aesthetic, reflecting the symbiotic relationship between humans and cattle. The artificial shape of the horns is regarded as adding to the beauty of the animal and also expresses the existence of close emotional ties between a favorite animal and its owner. Animals with modified horns can be regarded as having a special connection with the divine sphere or with the ancestors and are sometimes believed to possess exceptional powers. A common method of modifying the horns of chosen animals is to fracture the skull with a natural rock of suitable shape and size, or some kind of stone axe, so that the horns loosen and can be manipulated into the desired shape and position. Another method is to use a sharp blade to make a series of incisions into the horn at its base in order to break the horn sheet while twisting and pushing it loose. Heat can be applied to the horns to soften them and make them more malleable. After the procedure, the horns are secured with rope in their new shape until the bones have set. Several different horn styles exist, and these vary from one area to another as to the symbolic meanings associated with them. In one popular form, the horns can be made to curve outwards and upwards so that the tips overlap and form a closed circle. Another popular modification is to bend one horn upwards and backwards and the other forwards and downwards. The significance of cattle with shaped horns can also be recognized in clay figurines of cattle, which are toys. The tools that are used in horn shaping can be associated with symbolic value. Among the Pocot of Kenya, the stone axes that are used in the shaping of horns are inalienable and passed on from one generation to the next. Their value increases with their use over time and their association with specific animals. And the practice of modifying the horns of cattle into a desired shape has a very long history in Eastern Africa. And the earliest secure archaeological evidence comes from the Eastern Cemetery at Kerma in Nubia which was in use from the middle of the 3rd to the middle of the 2nd millennium BC. Thousands of skulls of bulls, steers, cows and calves, which had been cut so as to preserve only the frontal bone along with the horns, were found lying on the ground along the edges of the tumuli, which covered the largest and richest, bur richest burials in the cemetery. The skulls have been placed in rows and were probably intended symbolically to replicate herds, presumably indicating the persistence of wealth and power beyond the grave. Cuts at the base of the horns on a number of skulls demonstrate that they were from animals that had had their horns artificially shaped while alive in a manner comparable to that found today in Eastern Africa. In some cases, the left horn had been bent forwards and downwards, 
In other and more frequent cases, the horns had been brought together so that the tips touched. The skulls were arranged in rows according to age and sex, so calves, crow cows, bulls in separate rows. The cattle skulls are believed by the excavators of the burials at Kerma to have been deposited on, a, on single occasions as part of the funeral ritual of high status men. But given the very large number of skulls found with some of the burials, it may be, rather be that the original number was added to over many years, perhaps even centuries. And moving closer to Crete. The practice of horn shaping is also found in Egypt from an early date. It can be recognized at the end of the fourth millennium in the depictions of cows' heads with human faces that crowned an armor palette in which the horns are shown as curving inwards. In the lower panel on one of the sides, a bull with shaped horns, the tips of which curve inwards to an, to, to, as, so as almost to be touching is depicted. At Saqqara, several tombs of the first dynasty were decorated with cattle horns. Of particular interest in this connection is tomb uh, 3504, more than 300 bovine heads made of clay, but which had been fitted with real cattle horns, had been placed on a bench that ran around the outside of the tomb. Some of the ho to horns provide clear evidence for the practice of horn shaping in Egypt in this period. Cattle with shaped horns can also be recognized in Egyptian iconography from an early date. We can identify several animals with shaped horns in the depiction of a herd of cattle on the walls of the tomb of Sahura at Abu Sir. And also in a similar representation in the chapel of Thahatep at Saqqara, where we see a depiction of cattle being brought forth for inspection, perhaps for taxation. And both the tomb of Sahura and the chapel of Tahatep date to the 5th dynasty. An example dating to the Middle Kingdom is the tomb of Sanbi at Mer. It's very obvious. And the practice of horn shaping can also be recognized in the tomb of Amenemhept at Beni Hassan, dating to the New Kingdom. And in the tomb chapel of Nebamun at Thebes, also dating to the New Kingdom. The depiction of cattle with shaped horns on two Egyptian bronze bowls found in a Roman and Nubian tomb demonstrates the longevity of the practice of horn shaping in the Nile Valley in antiquity. It is interesting to note that cattle with modified horns shown in herds uh, in Egyptian iconography are often depicted as leaders, they're the first animals in the herds. This indicates probably their superior status within the herds and this would seem to correspond rather nicely with the significance given to animals with shaped horns in present day Eastern Africa where they are favored animals. Okay. The manipulation of the innate features of animals for various utilitarian purposes such as meatiness, wooliness or hardiness and strength was part of the so-called Neolithic Revolution and has continued since then. The evidence from Kerma in Egypt indicates that the modification of the appearance of animals for aesthetic, symbolic and other non-utilitarian reasons, which is not entirely uncommon today, also has roots that go far back into prehistory. My known representations of bovine heads display a variety of horn styles. The horns can be depicted as curving out and straight up, with the tips curving outwards, or they can curve inwards to form almost a complete circle, <coughs> or they can also curve downwards. The, um, differences, the different horn styles are neatly illustrated by the two axes with inscribed bovine heads. On the axe for Amari, the horns curve outwards, while on the axe from Knossos, the horns curve inwards with the tips almost touching. Whatever the style, my known images invariably depict the horns of cattle as symmetrical. The only image that I know of uh, in which the horns are depicted as asymmetrical with one horn curving downwards 
is on a seal of unknown provenance said to be found at Paini. And I'm not sure about this one. I don't think I can really make it out, but I think it might be a possible candidate. Um, the general impression given by the imagery from Bronze Age Crete is that the Minoans appreciated the aesthetic qualities of cattle horns, which they may have wished to form into styles that they found particularly pleasing. Several small clay figurines of bovines on which the horns seem to have been cut off very close to the skull provide some evidence for the cutting of horns of living animals was practiced on Crete, as has already been pointed out by John Younger. Further evidence for the practice is provided by an incised sketch of a bovine head on the back of the bull's head right on from the little palace at Knossos, which shows the horns as having had the upper parts cleanly cut off at an angle in a manner similar to the modern practice of sloping. Striations on the base of horns on depictions of bovines on seals could have been intended to represent cuts from a blade. So, it is probably not possible to demonstrate conclusively that horn shaping was practiced in Bronze Age Crete in a comparable manner to what we see in Kerma and Egypt without secure osteological evidence. Unfortunately, horns are subject to fast decay and are generally not preserved in archaeological context in the Aegean. There is, however, some osteological evidence for the symbolic significance of cattle horns in Bukrania. The skulls of two bovines, identified as our rocks, were found in the southwest and southeast corners of the southern basement of the, horn, of the house of the sacrificed oxen at Knossos, along with tripod offering tables. A skull said to be from an arox was found in the entrance to the side chamber of Tolosei at Ahannes. In the cave sanctuary at Sikro, a single bovine skull with preserved horns was found in a deposit in the upper part of the cave, along with fragments of charcoal and pottery. It had been cut out in a manner that is similar to what was found in the contemporary cemetery at Kerma, but the horns do not seem to have been modified. However, Given the close association between Egypt and Crete going back into the third millennium and the strong influence of Egyptian culture on Minoan culture, it would not be altogether surprising if the practice of horn shaping did exist on Crete. In present day Eastern Africa, the custom of horn shaping is practiced by people whose symbolic world has been conditioned by their dependence on their herds for survival. On the African continent, the origins of the custom may therefore, have its, have its, um, may therefore lie with pastoral people in eastern and northern Africa. But the practice did not die out with the rise of territorial states. The burials at Kerma in the 3rd and 2nd millennium BC, millennia BC demonstrate the importance of pastoral values in the context of advanced political centralization and urban development. The extravagant display of large numbers of Bukrania in high status funerary contexts indicate that cattle have become important to the expression of social and political power. Egypt can similarly be described as a cattle culture. The representations of cow's heads on the Narma palette are believed to represent the goddess Hathor, who was commonly depicted as a cow. On the palette, she is shown presiding over images that exemplify and the legitimacy and authority of the pharaoh. The power of the pharaoh and divine power were closely connected and are depicted as materialized in the bull with modified horns, which is shown trampling on a, on a fallen an enemy. Side. The iconography the iconographical evidence suggests that also the Minoans found cattle good to think with in relation to um, important social and political ideals. As Eric Callagher has shown in detail, palatial iconography, in particular Knossos, indicates that on Crete, as in Egypt and the Near East, the bull was a symbol of authority and kingship. There is, however, another side to the significance of cattle as an expression of power in Minoan Crete. Bovines are also depicted as animals that can be subjected to human control 
as in scenes which show cattle being captured or tossed up on presumably a sacrificial table. It is also reflected in the importance of the institution of the bull games in which the bull has been reduced to being a gymnastic prop for the display of human athleticism. In scenes of bull leaping, the agility, strength and grace that are characteristic of bulls are materialized by the human actors rather than by the animals. Whether it is done by cutting into the horns or by smashing the skull in order to loosen the horns, the, proceeding of, the procedure of shaping the horns of cattle requires skill and is often regarded as a specialized craft in Eastern Africa. <coughs> The procedure is also painful to the animal and may result in its death. If the animal does not die, it very often suffers brain damage. As a result, animals whose horns have been shaped tend to become docile and placid. In a sense, it could be said that the horn modifica modification procedures renders them more akin to humans. At all events, the procedure can be said to manifest the relationship between humans and domesticated animals in one in which humans are able to exert their power by changing the appearance and personality of their animals. If it is the case that the Minoans, like the contemporary Egyptians and Nubians, shaped the horns of selected animals, this adds another layer to our understanding of the symbolism associated with cattle in Minoan Crete and also with the the use of the double axe. Undoubtedly, the double axe, with its beautiful symmetrical form, was a symbol in its own right, the significance of which may go back to the introduction and development of metal technology for the manufacture of prestige tools and weapons. The double axe can, as no other type of early Bronze Age metal artifact be said to embody proficiency in working with copper and bronze, and this must certainly also have had a continuing relevance to its symbolic significance. However, its symbolic value would have been augmented by the contextual meanings of the various ways in which it was used and displayed, whether related to sacrifice, warfare, solar cult, or, as I have suggested in this paper, the expression of human-animal relations. Whatever the precise meaning of the double axe in relation to cattle may be, it represents probably both one facet of its meaning as a ritual symbol. Thank you very much for listening. How did you come up with this idea? <laughs> <laughs> By chance. Um, I was in the university bookstore one day and I saw a book about African archaeology. It was called Introduction to African Archaeology. And I thought, well, I don't know very much about archaeology in Africa. So I bought the book. And there was a sentence there which talked about access. And it just it was in a subordinate class that just said that axes were used for modifying the horns of cattle. And this made me immediately think of seals like that one. And I thought, you know, axes, cattle horns, where have I seen that before? and I decided to look into it. And, um, and the reference was to uh, present-day Eastern Africa, but at the end of the article, there was uh, a footnote about, with a reference to Egyptian iconography. So, and I thought, well, because at first I thought, well, modern-day Eastern Africa and my own uh, Crete are far from each other, both geographically and chronologically. But I thought, well, ancient Egypt, um, <laughs> there may be something to uh, work with there. Um, so I looked up the reference, and uh, then I just started looking at, um, and I thought, well, that was very convincing. Um, and some of the um, ancient Egyptian pictures I showed here. And then I found others. And the I found this really, really fascinating. And, um, but the strange thing, or what I thought was very strange, was that Egyptologists did not seem to be very much interested in it. Sometimes they note the fact, so they're aware of, of the custom, but you know, they do not seem to have shown any particular interest for it. And, uh, and then I looked into, uh, and then I thought, um, and then I just googled horn modification, <laughs> and then I came up with the fact that it was, you know, very common in modern-day farming. And I thought that was interesting too, because today most people who uh, breed cattle choose polled um, cattle, you know, cattle who have been uh, selectively breeded, so they no longer have horns. 
but many do not, and uh, and this causes them uh, extra work and so on because if you know if the wolves if the uh, if their cattle have horns to go out there, and then they're a danger to each other when they're crowded together when they're being corralled. So, uh, and it was very clear that those who choose horns think, you know, cattle should have horns. It's part of cattle. So there's an aesthetic and symbolic aspect to that as well. And um, yeah, <laughs> so that was uh, how <laughs> I came up with the idea and why I thought I might possibly uh, be able to do something with this. Uh, but as I said, it's a bit speculative. And uh, yes. Yeah. Thanks very much for a uh, very interesting paper. Um, I was just wondering, um, thinking about the Egyptian and Nubian uh, associations, do you see in Egypt and Nubia, this association specifically with with axes and uh, and cattle. No, in the same way. I don't. Um, when it comes to the um, when it comes to the African material, which may also go back to prehistory, uh, stone axes are used, but uh, no, as far as I know, no metal axes. So this would be specific to Crete. Uh, and um, and unless uh, I mean I try to do a thorough search, but as far as I can see, it's not really been discussed in the Egyptological literature. So, uh, but I haven't come across it there either. It's there's no dis I haven't seen any discussions of the methods they were using or may have been using in ancient Egypt. No, I mean you you do get access in. in yes, Egypt. you get access. I mean not. Yeah, you get access. But it's, it's interesting. I've never seen that association no. specifically either. So no, I so there are access. So it was, you know, it was a reference to access, to stone access, and to modification of cattle horns, which sort of started me off because, you know. Um, but um, they are different from the double axis. But on the other hand, uh, the double axis is obviously um, a symbol which has been very much elaborated and so on. And although we do have functional axis, um, uh, which could have been used for a lot of things, you know, probably. They may have been used in warfare, they may have been used in sacrifice. Uh, I mean, I, was, I still don't think we can um, s um, exclude those interpretations. But, um, uh, but I mean, if the double axis a symbol uh, could stand for this, it might, it might have been the idea of an axe where very different axes would have been used. But I mean, that's speculation. Um, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't had a chance to try it out, <laughs> and I wouldn't want to either. <laughs> I'm an animal lover, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, yeah. But I think you know, of, of an axe of the right, of a double axe of the right size, it probably, it probably would work. I thought the picture uh, which I showed of uh, a stone axe being used in. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, So, more, more questions? Thank you, thank you. Um, externally, the image that I get is that there were bovines all over Crete. Yes. How, what, what are the percentages of bone that you get from bovines? In, oh, I don't really know. I haven't, I haven't looked at that. Um, Sorry, but um, so, uh, no, yes. So, yeah, no, I'm afraid I don't know. It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> I think it might be an interesting thing yeah, to see. Yeah, well, how is it projected? Yeah, and how much of it is actually there? Mm. Maybe. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, I try to look for. I, but when I was working this, obviously, I tried to look for osteological evidence, uh, and I couldn't find any. Uh, the closest I could come was the skull from the Psycho Cave, which had been cut in a manner which is very similar to what you find in Kerma. But the horns, do n I mean, this was published in 1902, I think, but I think from the picture, it's pretty obvious that the horns were perhaps not manipulated, but it's hard to say, uh, at least, you know, for me. Um, and um, so I think I'm, I mean, I think the imagery that I've shown is 
fairly suggestive, but I think you really do need to secure evidence of horns having been manipulated to say this was practiced in Crete. Uh, but I mean, it was definitely practiced in contemporary Egypt, so yeah, that's, uh, who knows. <laughs> The, you spoke about something very interesting at the end. Mm. Um, it was all quite interesting, especially the fact that when you looked into contemporary farm farmers, mm. yeah. some wanted cattle with horns mm. and some didn't want yes. it. Why did the Minoans want the cattle, the, the horned bovines on their, uh, on their iconography? Well, I mean, cattle are not naturally have horns, so it's through selective breeding that you can get rid of them. I'm not sure if they had com uh, were breeding in that way in the ancient world. I think probably all animals, all cattle would have had horns. Um, so, um, I'm not, yeah, that's probably something I should look, but, um, but uh, I think, I'm not quite sure when they started uh, breeding polled cattle, but I don't think it goes back further than, I don't know, 18th century, something like that. Um, Anybody know? <laughs> no. but, yeah. but I mean, uh, cattle are in Cretan imagery, you know, there, or I think on imagery from the ancient, from the ancient world are always shown with the horns. Um, and um, so, uh, and of course, I think uh, whether you um, are convinced by the fact that the Cretan may, may have, or the Minoans may have shaped the horns of their animals. I mean, the image should just show that they're very interested in their horns and they're portrayed in a, you know, a spectacular way. But, um, yeah. Okay. Yes? Yes, thank you very much for your paper. Um, I think it's quite clear that both male and female cattle have horns yes, yes. until very recently. Yes, yes. Mm. And there's been studies uh, on horns and their function mm. as weapons yeah. that animals use, yes. mm. uh, which ties in with, mm. with does, your yeah, yeah. interpretation. Mm. Yeah. So both male, male cattle and female cattle yes. are using their horns as weapons, yeah. either offensive or defensive. Mm. Um, now, the manipulation of horns, I think there's also evidence that horns come in different shapes, even yes. at the same time. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. contemporary uh, yeah. cattle may mm. have very different shapes of horns. Yes. That is especially at an early late, yeah. uh, age mm. like that. Yeah. Um, and manipulation, uh, evidence for manipulating horns is very difficult to prove, perhaps. We don't have very much no, I mean, iconography we have, on that. No. And I mean, that is a pro another problem with the, uh, with the hypothesis, because um, you cannot be entirely sure if, um, you know, I mean, uh, presumably cattle on Crete in the Bronze Age would have had different styles of horns naturally. But different size of different cattle. Different sizes, yeah, and different time. size of cattle. And there may have been different breeds as well, as some people have suggested. Um, but I think, um, let's see, no, yes or no, yeah. And I looked at all the seal images to try to see if I could find any iconographical. I mean, this is the only one I could come up with. And I discussed it with John Younger. And because I thought, well, he has one point horn pointing upwards and the other one pointing downwards. And I mean, it's not proof, but at least it could be an indication. And uh, I mean, again, cattle horns can be damaged uh, mm -hmm. in various ways. But I mean, uh, why would uh, the Minoans portray uh, a, a bull, or is this a bull? Yes, a bull. A bull with a damaged horn on a seal. Um, well, as you say, it's a single one. It's a single and, one. Uh, yeah, I know. Artistic license, because yes. the body of the human being would yeah. interfere with mm. uh, the mm. second horn? Quite possibly, but I mean, we have God other men <laughs> images of bull leaping where they don't have that problem. And then there's the other one, which I can't really make out, but I'm not sure if, 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 if one horn is going upwards and that one, the other one is going down. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, that might be another example. Um, 
However, manipulating the horns by cutting them off, yes. that is quite well documented. Yes. And there, there, apart from Psyra, there is a, uh, an example from Macroteria yeah, as well. Yeah, I know. Yeah. There, I think there are two from yeah. my non Crete and one yeah. from the uh, Criteria. Uh, and then there's this, uh, which uh, Paul Rehack drew our attention to in an article of, uh, some years back. And I mean, this seems to have the horns cut off. And this is, yeah. you know, quite close to the modern procedure of sloping where you cut yeah. the horns off at an angle. Um, and again, <laughs> this, the striations there at the base of the horns, are they marks from a blade meant to represent? So, yeah. Uh, I, I'm also aware of um, the cutting of horns mm. of sacrificial bulls in contemporary Greece. Yeah. Mm. I can't remember exactly where right now, but uh, it's, it's a ritual yeah. which still goes on mm -hmm. uh, in the Greek yeah. island. Yeah. But thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Any other question? Yes. Thank you very much for the very stimulating speech. I want to ask you if you have, a, because we noticed that there are many cases where a sacred knot is represented <coughs> close to this, uh, to the double axe. Uh, have you examined this association and what is the symbolism for this sacred knot? Oh, sacred, no, I haven't looked at the sacral knot, I'm afraid. Uh, I tried to a long time ago and I couldn't really come up with anything. Uh, but uh, obviously, yeah, I mean, there are, lots of, uh, there are lots of symbols associated with cattle and there are lots of symbols associated with the double axe. So uh, this is just trying to explain one of them. Um, and um, I mean, traditionally, uh, double hax has been associated with sacrifice. So I mean, uh, but I thought, uh, but I mean, yeah, uh, it's been, but I thought uh, perhaps I could suggest another uh, possible uh, explanation. Uh, but I haven't looked at cycle knots or that, I'm afraid not. <laughs> Um, you mentioned also the um, modification on some oryx skulls. Yes. And um, I was, it seems, struck me as, as, as that's a very, presumably very difficult thing yeah. to do, mm. to try and modify a skull yeah. of the wild I cattle. Yeah. Is this perhaps an evidence of, of sort of early attempts at domestication, or, or I mean, what were your thoughts on um, that? Probably not, because they, they are quite late, uh, late my own period. So. I don't think, uh, as from what I know about aurochs, I don't think it would have been possible to modify the horns of live animals. Uh, but um, so I think this is a feature of domestication. I think um, that's also the impression, uh, or that's also what the evidence from uh, from um, from Eastern Africa and from the prehistoric Sudan and Kerma and ancient Egypt said this has to do with domestication. And I think it really it has to do with power. I mean, um, or the human animals relationship, which is based on power because humans have power over their animals and in some way. But there's also, if you read some of the ethnographical evidence, um, the cattle that have horn modified horns, which are often because they're well, the procedure is very dangerous to them, and you know, the, the, many of them are brain damaged and they become very placid. So they become more like, I don't know, dogs. I mean, the sort of animals that you can have a personal relationship with. And, um, uh, but I think, I mean, there's also, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, also the auric skull from uh, Ahanes. Uh, so obviously, but I think they would have been exceptional. Uh, I'm, I tried, uh, I'm not sure whether the aurochs. There can't have been that many aurochs left on Crete in the Bronze Age, but there must have been some, obviously. But um, yeah, I don't think this would apply to them. I think this is just domesticated cattle. And, um, yeah. Well, thank you once again, Helen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I saw a couple of barrels of Puzzle and on the table oh, out there. Nice. So please stay on for a glass of wine and some snacks. <laughs>